Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Outdated Wrestling Hour. What an episode we have for you. It's Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. I remember Dr. Jerry Graham Sr. too. He was a really big guy and tough as nails. Well, all I know about Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. is he's not quite as big, but still tough as nails. He was a manager, too. I hated him. He had a big mouth. He just would, he had a motor mouth. He just kept going and going and going and talking and talking and talking. He talked so much through, well, I just, I threw a shoe at the TV and I broke the channel knob. I still have it though, my 1964 Philco console. And I'm going to go and listen to the outdated wrestling hour. Well, not on the TV, you silly. the silly one old guy. Hi, everybody. This is Bob Smith. You might remember me from my days with Pro Wrestling Illustrated, and this is the Outdated Wrestling Hour. Some shows I do because I think a lot of people are going to like them. I try to come up with new concepts, different guests, you know. I, I don't try to be like everybody else that's out there. I just want to kind of do my own thing. But this show is for me, capital M, capital E. I have wanted this gentleman on my show since the very beginning when I first formulated the idea and the concept of the outdated wrestling hour. Because in the mid-80s, this fellow helped, well, rebuild a classic promotion, the WWA, Indianapolis-based. And I'll tell you what, this is Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. He is a wrestling genius. Now, don't laugh at me. He always proclaimed himself a wrestling genius, too. But he really was. And we'll explain why on this really special show. I think you're going to get a big kick out of this guy if you've never heard his words. He was a one-of-a-kind character, one-of-a-kind manager, and a one-of-a-kind force backstage for Dick the Bruiser during the Bruiser Bedlam years and beyond. So like I always say, get you a nice beverage, get a nice snack, settle in. We got a good one with uh, Jerry Jaffe, better known in the wrestling world as Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. Here's a commercial break. Very short, and we're going to get right to it. Get yourself a drink. Get yourself a snack. You're going to enjoy this one. I guarantee it, because this guy is one of a kind, Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. Short little break. We will be right back. It's the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, available at the click of a button at WrestleCopia.com and anywhere that podcasts are heard. This week, I want to take a look at episode 68 of Regional Wrestling Podcast with a good friend, Ray Russell. It's UD Ref finishing from October 1986. I love the little write-up they have here. It says, Missy Hyatt turns on Hollywood John Tatum. Savannah Jack turns babyface. A country whipping tag team match. Ted DiBiase and Terry Taylor versus the Freebirds. A new Power Pro format. Buddy Landell is back and a lot more. Wow. That's a pretty good show. It's this week's Regional Wrestling Podcast. Don't miss that one. Episode 39 of The Wrestling Stoop with Bob Roop. This week they play the name game as Bob talks about Don Morocco, the Steamboats, the Steinborns, Abe Jacobs, Bugsy McGraw, Ring Rats, and more. Nobody else like Bob Roop out there, and you only hear him in The Wrestling Stoop with Bob Roop. That's the current edition. The current edition of The Wrestling Memory Grenade with Ray Russell. It's August 1988, WWF news and results. Chip Macho Man versus Andre. Elizabeth gets injured. Ultimate War is going for gold. And an outlaw versus a gorilla. That and a whole lot more on the Wrestling Memory Grenade. 
As I write, this is the latest episode of the uh, Regional Wrestling Podcast with Gene Jackson, my good friend. This is their 17th episode, and it looks at the USWA from April 10, 1993. General Jerry Lawler, in full uniform, mind you, he revives the King's Army for Wrestle War 93. Plus, on the show, Jeff Jarrett, the Moondogs, the rough and tough chair swinging Moondogs. Scotty Flamingo, PG 13, wherever I heard that before. Danny Davis with the Harlem Knights and more. All that and a lot more, as they always say, on the Retro Wrestling Review. Yeah, there's a whole mess of great shows on the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. In addition to those shows and this show, there's also Pure o Academy, Doug Gilbert's brand new podcast, Wrestling Nostalgia with Dave Dynasty, Monday Warfare, The Other Ship Podcast, Captain's Corner, GrappleCon, TR Shocks the World, WCNN News, and The Power Hour. Great selection of podcasts, all different kinds of styles. Some of them are pretty wacky, some of them are stone serious. But you'll find them all as part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. I'll make it easy for you. Just type in WrestleCopia.com and you're off to the races. As I mentioned in the intro, folks, when I started this podcast, this gentleman was somebody I wanted to get on so badly. I wanted to introduce him to America just in case enough of America hasn't heard of him. He was a fine wrestler with a great name and a great connection early in his career. And he, it led to work that he did in Indianapolis for Bruiser Bedlam and Dick the Bruiser years later. That's one of the greatest revivals of a territory I have ever seen. He was a star maker, both in front of and behind the camera. He's as brilliant as any wrestling mind that you will ever find in the history of this sport. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to welcome Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Bob, and thank you very much for having me on your show. I've been listening to your previous shows, and you do a great job. Well, thank you. Coming from you, that's a real compliment. Speaking of a great job, um, I have to thank our mutual friend, Dave Dynasty, because it's like, uh, I guess it was about two years ago, I'm sitting at home during the pandemic, right? And I'm bored. You know, I'm my job is closed down. I'm not doing anything. And I start watching. I'm looking for something different to watch in wrestling videos, you know? And I worked for PWI, as you know, from 1988 to about 1995, for Wrestling Illustrated. And I, I knew about the WWA and I knew about the great Wojo and I know we did some stuff on him a few times and, and some things on on you a couple of times, but I'll be honest, they didn't cover you a whole lot and you knew it too. I know that, but, uh -huh. but I, 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 I find this show called Bruiser Bedlam on YouTube. I go, oh, that looks interesting. And I start to watch it and I see Terry Sullivan and I said, Whoa. I knew Terry from Detroit. I used to call him the kid in Detroit because he just kind of walked on the show one day in the 70s, had long hair. And I'm watching more of it. And Terry's doing commentary with Dick the Bruiser. I'm going, this is, this is really interesting. So I look for another episode and another episode until I get to like the mid 80s. There's, there's, that's Scott Steiner. And I'm, yeah, I trained him. Yeah. I, I worked him his first probably 100 matches. I had him in the gym. I showed him how to lock up, how to grab a headlock, and uh, and uh, and sent him on his way. And he did great. I'm so proud of him. Yeah, he really did. I mean, you you knew it though. I mean, wasn't it in his first? When I first worked out with Steiner. I've told this story before, but he picked up everything so fast. I stopped the workout. I said, "Look, this is a joke. This is a rib. This guy's already been trained mm -hmm. because everything I'm showing him, he's doing correctly." So who? Uh, and, he's, and they swore, no, he's never been with a pro wrestler. His older brother's pro wrestling. But other than that, uh, uh, he's had no training whatsoever. So this is the kind of talent he had innately was uh, I could show him how to do something and, and he could do it. <laughs> right. It was, it was really uh, uh, a pleasure training him. And it was uh, uh, I'm happy to see the, uh, how far he went in the business. Yeah. Well, anyway, to get back to my original point, which I'll wrap up succinctly. Uh I thought the show was great. And the more I saw of it, especially in that mid eighties period when he was there and the great Wojo and you, you had the part where you had your, uh, actually legitimate car accident. I've been led to understand. Right. I mean, that, that period through there, 
generated the most real heat in those arenas than any other wrestling promotion I saw in that period of time. I am serious. You did a fantastic job reviving the WWE. I, I can't I can't stress that enough. And I want people, even though it's decades later, I want people to go tune in because the stuff is good, man. It was really, really good. Well, uh, I appreciate the compliments. Like I said, that well, I could always said it was a joint effort. It was an ensemble cast, as I say in the right, theater. Right. A lot of great wrestlers there. A lot of them never had an opportunity to get, to work you know, on a little bit higher uh, at level. And we uh, put a, a cast together, if I'm going to call them a cast, a crew. We put a crew together. And what I was looking for was I wanted as many stars as I could get, but I didn't want anybody to be invincible. In other words, when a match would start, a lot of times you, they know, the fans know who's going to win. Mm-hmm. They know this guy, but a lot of times, like if you're watching, if Cowboy Rex Bodhi was going to wrestle Muhammad Jihad Saad, who was going to win? Nobody, you know, they're both top. They both got 90% wins. Mm-hmm. And you go right there from Chris Carter to wrestling Denny Cast to go on, just go right down the list. We tried to make as many matches as I could where the fans would wonder because that gets their interest in the match. They wonder, they're, they're talking. I think he's going to win. I think he's going to win. And that's what I tried to accomplish with, uh, with Bruiser Bedlam was a, uh, a series of matches where people really were uh, paying attention because they weren't saying, well, no, this guy is going to get killed. And uh, uh, we had some matches like that too, of course, the squash jobs, but uh, we mixed them in. And then I did what I thought, or maybe you want to ask me about it, but uh, the Steiner Wojo match, mm-hmm. that was something that uh, I came up with uh, I was trained by a, an old timer named Martino Angelo. He was a star in the thirties, forties, fifties, and sixties. Old timer Sicilian from Canada, but he moved to Toledo. And he, uh, I learned from so many people, uh, and that was the secret to my success. I, I, I've said this before, but I, I, I didn't wake up a genius knowing everything about wrestling. I had a lot of good minds telling me things. Uh, the list of guys that took the time to help me was just a who's who in wrestling. I appreciate each and every one of them helping me. But he says, when the fans get ahead of the promotion is when it starts to get weak. When they know it's going to be a double disqualification, you know, Dick the Bruiser versus the Sheik, everybody in the place knew there wasn't going to be a winner. And one time, Dick the Bruiser and the Sheik had a terrific match in Toledo and ended with a, the week that they announced it before, the fans were yelling, double DQ, double count out. They were, they were predicting it. And I was sitting there watching a match with Rip Hawk, and he did have a great match, but they ended up both getting disqualified. And Rip Hawk said, what would have happened if the bruiser would have pinned the Sheik in the middle of the ring, everybody would have been happy, and then the Sheik hit him with a ball of fire after the match was over. He said, this place would be going crazy. There'd be so much heat. Give the people what they want and take it away from them. They wanted to see Bruiser win, but Bruiser gets carried out on a stretcher. That's a Rip Hawk who was one of the many minds that, that helped me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm saying that's I mean, that's what I want. I didn't want people saying this guy and that guy. So uh, I had Scott out on the road, Scott Steiner, for 15, 20 matches, mostly with Bulldog Don Kent, who was a great technician and a good teacher mm-hmm. for, for him to work with. But then we brought him in as a complete nobody against uh, Wojo. And every fan watching TV and every fan in the arena figured, well, this is just another smash job for Wojo. And all of a sudden, Wojo's not the champion anymore. And the place went crazy. Right. In part two, which is also Martino Angelo, he says, get the belt on a baby face and have him do heel finishes to screw the heels. <laughs> and that's what we did. Every time Wojo tried to get his belt back, Steiner would end up doing, a, he'll put his feet on the ropes or do this or do that. And, uh, and it just reversed everything. And people were going crazy. The, the, the attendances were way up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we uh, then came the uh, the tag matches, and uh, you know we, we we programmed it out, and then Scott went on to I think he had to, I think he went to Memphis or Nashville or somewhere when he left us, but uh, but uh, he did a really good job for us, and uh, and then we uh, carried on. Yeah, that was a great period for the promotion. I, I just thought this stuff was first rate. I really did because, like I said, watch the crowds. I watched the crowds on those matches, and the, the heat is tremendous. And, and you know they really loved the faces and they really hated the heels and it all worked. Nobody hated, hated worse than one of the nicest guys I've met, Chris Carter, who you turn. I, I called him the second best heel turn of the 1980s, just after Larry Zabisco. 
I'm serious. Yeah, well, learning Nabisco and Bruno, that was right. That was a real shocker. That, that, but that was the same psychology at work. See, what happened is Carter and I were a heel tag team. Right. And I got in that accident. And I was in the hospital for 10 days. And uh, I don't want to cry about that, but I'm just saying the situation. And they were going to do promos in Toledo. And Carter came up to the hospital to visit me before he went to the TV station. And I says, Chris, well, I want you. I was really weak, too. I says, go in there and tell them that you think I'm an absolute sissy, that this was absolutely, you, you, you thought Dr. Graham was somebody, he's nothing. And he says, I broke my leg once in a wrestling match. And I set up myself and walked back to Detroit from Toledo. Uh, just to get the kinks out. He says, this Graham's later crying like a little girl, so it makes me want to sick. The next day, the program director from Channel 36, Fox Toledo, called me and said, the camera crew didn't even want to film Carter. They hated him. He was there laughing about your car accident. And were, all through my instructions. And uh, that led up to a, for a brief period of time. It was the biggest dollar uh, gate in the history of Toledo wrestling when I wrestled Chris Carter. When I say dollars, at the sports arena in the old days, they used to do Four, five, six thousand people, but it would only be a buck a seat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Nature Boy Buddy Rogers had that record from the 50s. But our record was dollar and cents because 6,000 seats times a buck is $6,000. But the match between Carter and I did $15,000. And no other promotion had ever done $15,000 in Toledo before. However, just a few months later, Hulk Hogan came to town and uh, our record was history. But, right, <laughs> but right, at least right, we, well. we had it for a while. That's how much interest there was in the, in the, it, in the match. Right? But, the, come back. but the fact that you guys were doing that then, you know, at that particular period of time, you were kind of keeping up with the Joneses as best you could. And it worked. Everything was working. I mean, the the tag team that Carter did with Muhammad Jihad Saad. Yeah, um, American Freedom Fighters. Yeah. And not only that. The Bruiser Bedlam show got really good. I mean, I like the wraparounds when you had, you know, Graham's Gallery for yeah. a while before you got hurt. I, I like the fact that, there, you know, there'd be people in the studio talking about the matches beforehand, building heat. Like, Chris got a lot of heat on that stuff. And, by the way, the selection of Terry Sullivan was really inspired. Did he do a great job or what? Well, that's why I fought for him. They had some other people in mind. And when they kind of put me in charge, Bruiser, you know, he was... Paying attention, he was, certainly wasn't an absentee manager, but he, he let me walk the territory. And I absolutely insisted on Terry Sullivan because, to me, there's nobody better. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get involved in either wrestling or commentary. That I don't say anybody is the best, but I will say somebody like that, nobody's better. Mm -hmm. Like Terry Funk, was he the best worker? There was nobody better. There might have been guys as good, but there was nobody better. Right. As far as Terry Sullivan was concerned, there was nobody better. And there's guys just as good, maybe, but uh, he was the one I wanted, and he was just perfect. Him and Bruiser just made a perfect team. Mm -hmm. They really did. Yeah, it was, like I said, I, I'm so enthusiastic about telling people about that period of Bruiser Battle because it was legitimately great stuff. And you know what? The people that I have told went and watched it, and they said, wow, you were right. I had no idea. So people are yeah. finding this stuff, what is it, 35 years later or whatever, 45 years? Yeah, well, it's... uh. It's something, you know, it, it was interesting because you've seen the content. And at one time in Toledo, they had uh, WWE, Bruiser Bedlam, and WCW. And the ratings, we took second. We we beat WCW, but of course we couldn't beat WW, well, WWF at that time. We right. COVID that. Nobody right. could beat that. But the funny thing about it is our demographics for women between, uh, I think it was 20 and 49, were the highest of all three shows. So I said to myself, and we certainly weren't the best looking guys. <laughs> yeah. We certainly weren't the best built guys. We were big and tough and rough, but we were not. Uh, so the only thing I could figure what attracted the women was they must be more violent than men because we did have the bloodiest, wildest show. You did, in yeah. Three. yeah. Three. So I think women must be more violent than we, we poor innocent guys think because that was the biggest demographic for women, uh, 18 or 20, whatever it was, in that early 20 to 40, uh, 50 group that was that, that was a huge demographic that we had wwe's biggest uh, was children and wcw did get the men right. but we had higher numbers overall from wcw so i you know these kind of things we uh makes me feel good that we did something you uh, did i'll tell you what i like the flavor of that time period because like when you were still before your accident you were teaming as a, a championship team with don ken i remember and 
you had one match where you just decimated this pair of guys. I don't remember their names. They were, I guess, in and out. Bloodied them up for minutes and minutes. And I said, you know, this is like Detroit mixed with, you know, Sam Menneker's old thing mixed with WWE. It was like it was like a hodgepodge of different vibes all at the same time. Well, I think that the the fans like that wild meat chopping type, but not every match. Now, Randy Savage and I used to work a lot of opening matches for the Sheik, which, as most promoters will tell you, the opening match is the second most important match on the card being only second to the main event, which sells the tickets, but the opening match sets a tone for the people. And if you don't have a good opening match, you know, people get down, you got to work harder to bring the crowd up. So uh, Randy and I always had good opening matches. But one time the Sheik, as we were talking about scientific wrestling as opposed to meat chopping, he said, nobody else uses a gimmick. Nobody else fights outside the ring. Nobody else. So at that time, Randy and I were younger and said, who the hell, that's what he does. But now as I got older, I said, he was absolutely correct. If everybody grabbed a gimmick and fought outside the ring and got blood and this and that, by the time he got in the ring, it wouldn't mean anything anymore. So it's absolutely right. So what we would do is, uh, as we mentioned before, we would save all that for the main events. And then we'd get the guys out that were good at that because it's a different, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of, some guys could be great mechanics and not too comfortable in a, in a meat chopping match and vice versa. A lot of good meat choppers weren't the best mechanics. Mm-hmm. But uh, you got to find a place for everybody. and. Uh, and that's what we tried to do. But so uh, getting back to the, the violent part uh, and the women, is that, that could be it. There was more blood on our show than uh, anybody else's and uh, and more violence and more uh, just wild, crazy, fly all over the building type. Now, they called it Bedlam, right? Right. Right. Bedlam it is. You got to live up to it. And that's, yeah. one th- that's one thing wrestling does more than any other sport or any other form of entertainment. When they say... It's going to be wild. It's going to be wild. I mean, it, 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 pro wrestling at its best has been able to live up to the hype. So I, also, I always usually end up mentioning when I uh, do an interview with anyone is uh, Boozer Bedlam. Mm-hmm. Uh, very quickly, I, with the help of some other people, uh, reorganized the WWA. And uh, Scott Romer told me that Boozer really, because uh, I had a feeling that Boozer didn't like me too much. I was useful because I was good and I was drawing money. But I always got the impression that maybe he was a little, uh, Scott told me, absolutely not. You added several years to his career. And he said it was, it was right at the end when you uh, reevaluated everything. But Bruiser Bedlam, in spite of what some of I call pseudo uh, wrestling experts say, did not go broke. I want to make that very, very clear. We made money. Every show, every one of the partners, there's four of us, got a sheet saying how much money came in what the, all the expenses were, what the profit was, and I always put a portion in the bank. And we had a huge amount of money banked. And uh, after a few years went by, and our second-to-last match was Wojo versus Leon Spinks, the mixed boxer wrestling match. I believe, and I could be wrong, it was the only time the two Olympic gold medal winners and pro champions from boxing and wrestling met. Because Leon Spinks is a gold medal winner, and Leon and Wojo got an honorary gold medal from President Carter when they boycotted the Games. Then we found out that the WCW was going to start going on the road. Now, I had a meeting with Bruiser, and we decided that what the WWF was doing was going to the, most of their towns three times a year. And we could work around three times a year because there's room for smaller promotion. But now WCW was going to do the same thing, so that became six times a year. And Bruiser and I both thought that would be too much. And so we decided to close up shop. But we closed up shop on several profitable years. And then the money that I put back in saved became a nice severance pay for the shareholders, which were Victor Bruiser, me, Chris Carter, and Wojo. We all got a nice check, and we uh, closed down. That's what a good businessman does. He, uh, Aldous Huxley said, inevitable consequences are beacons for wise men and scarecrows for fools. <laughs> we knew it was time to cut bait. There were some other promotions came after us. I wish everybody well. But, you know, things things didn't work out too well because of, then it was just too hot and heavy between the Monday Night Wars and all that. Right. There, uh, I know there might have been a smaller promotion here or there like Memphis that was able to stay in business. But most of us, uh, most of the guys went broke because they, they didn't know when to let go. But when you got a business and you can see the future is not good, you close up. So it was a profitable venture beginning to end. And nobody went broke at Bruiser Bedlam. The investors all made a lot of money and it got a lot good uh, severance pay at the end. That is fascinating. 
that's fascinating because, you know, if you ask Joe Blow wrestling fan, he'll say something different. They'll go, oh, they just, they faded away. You know, they don't know the real behind the scenes things that go on with it, how a business is run. I was going to say, the second to last match we had, Toledo was packed with Spinks and Wojo. And we had one more match after that in a small town in western Ohio near the Indiana border, did $8,000. It was a fundraiser for a booster club. Right. And then that, that was it. We decided it was time to go. Then at that point, Chris Carter and Gary Warnchak started their own promotion, and they did the right thing. They offered me a position to come in as a partner, but I, I didn't think without TV. It was just, I told them I worked for them, and they didn't have to pay me a lot and do everything I could to help them. But I didn't want to get financially involved in another, any other promotion. I wouldn't told anybody else no. Uh, because I just didn't think it was the right time. I would have gone to work for any, I was working for a lot of independents as an employee. I would, I'd get, I knew I was going to make money and I worked for the guys that were, you find out quick which guys don't pay you and which guys do. So I, I worked through the nineties to the independent circuit just because I liked wrestling. It was like part time. Mm-hmm. And I always had my family business, which was the Tyler Meat Company, the largest wholesale meat dealer in Toledo. And uh, at the end, the only one. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was my always my major source of income. So I was never a slave to these promoters that like to get guys boxed in and and, and keep them there. And uh, you know, they don't have enough money to leave. And there was a lot of that unscrupulous stuff going on. But I was I was fortunately I had the second source of income. I didn't quit my day job. Okay, right, right. <laughs> That's what you tell guys that aren't any good. Uh, be it wrestling or show business. It's a, it could be a singer or a comedian. The, if he doesn't do well, they say, don't quit your day job. So, so I took their advice. I didn't quit my day job. There you go. Uh, Smart. Well, you you were the genius. You you self-proclaimed on the, on the show all the time. And let me tell you something. As a manager, or as, shall we say, a bad guy manager, you were great, man. You are in my top five all time. You were a talker. Thank you. For, but for anybody who's never seen those tapes, it's worth seeing Graham's Gallery. Well, you'll see amazing stuff like him lacing in Bobo Brazil or having a shouting match with uh, George Crybaby Cannon. It just went on and on, the great moments on those interviews. You, ha- you had the gift. You really did. I wish more people had seen it at the time. Well, I, like I said, I, I, I did okay. I was, uh, I'm, I'm happy with my career. But I, uh, I remember, here's a story. I'll tell you a story I've never told before. I was with George Cannon when he started doing business with Vince McMahon. And McMahon, apparently, I wasn't privy to the conversation, but I'll take George at his word, said that they need a new manager. Did he know of anybody? So he says, well, we've got Jerry Graham uh, Jr. here. He said, send us a demo tape. So I sent them a demo tape. And this is what I've never told anybody because I just never thought about it. It's not a big secret. But at that time, Bob Backlund was still the champion. And he was doing that thing with the belly roller where he'd roll back and forth on a Mm-hmm. With two thousand, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So anyway, I came on the tape. This was just a demo tape we sent to WWF with Wojo, and I had the belly roller. And I says, you know, I've been watching uh, your show, and I think I'm so impressed with Bob Backlund's ability to do two or three thousand reps from the belly roller. But you know, the name of this show and the name of this game is wrestling, not belly rolling. And Wojo can't do two reps with the belly roller. But I tell you what, he can do with his belly roller. He can shove it down Bob Backlund's throat, and do a three sixty pull out half of the tensions, and pin him in thirty seconds. That's something Wojo can do with his belly roller. And Bob Backlund knows it better than I do, and that's why you'll never see the match. On that interview, they hired me to come to uh, St. Louis. Uh, my one time in St. Louis, and uh, I just say that it's, it's not good to speak ill of the dead, but. Uh, I told that story so many times I don't want to bore you with repeating it, but uh, uh, I, I didn't get along with Pat Patterson. Okay. You can fill in the blanks. Well, I I, I have seen your match. Uh, we had Big John Studd, right? You were bringing mm-hmm. him to the ring, and uh, Mr. Terry Sullivan tells me that they told you, don't say anything. Now, yes. I, now I'm, I'm looking, I'm thinking about what he's telling me, and I'm going, wait a minute. It's one of the greatest talkers I've ever seen on camera on a wrestling show. And they're telling him, don't say anything. I couldn't believe what he told me. Well, it was even funnier than that because just before it went out, you know, you want to have the best show possible. So you want your guys prepared. But uh, these days, I was just ready to walk to the ring with Stud and Pat Patterson comes up behind me and says, don't do anything. Don't grab anybody's foot. Don't run up and down outside the ring. Just stand there. And when the match is over, Gene Okerman's going to ask you a question. 
and you're going to answer it. We're not going to tell you what the question's going to be because we want to see how good you are on your feet and how spontaneous you are. But we'll tell you this, the whole segment, including the question and the answer, is only going to be one minute. So without any preparation, I walked out there and just stood there like a schmo and watched John Studd beat his guy. And the question was, uh, they called me, my name was Megan Manigoff, and they changed my name. I don't know why, but that's what they wanted. They're the boss, so that was okay. He says, Megan Manigoff, what does John Studd need you in his corner for? He's a big man. He's 6'10". He's, he's a monster. What does he need you for? He says, well, I'll tell you what he needs me for. He needs me to make sure that crooked referees don't take advantage of him, that crooked promoters don't take advantage of him, that these commissioners get the fair call if they see something controversial. In other words, I cover all of his business. I got his back. All he has to worry about is his opponent. I take care of everything else. Now, to me, with no preparation, not knowing what the question was going to be, I thought, not bad. Not bad. When I got back to this room, the office didn't yell at me. John Stubb did. You're supposed to talk about me. You're supposed to tell me how great I am. I can't be slammed. I can't be like him. I said, John, did you hear the question? Uh, I said, I don't know what you want from me. They, they, they gave me no preparation. They asked me a question. And I came up with the quickest answer I had, which is why you needed me. And he was just adamant. And then, he used to brag to people that he got me. I mean, I didn't, once again, he's a passed on. I don't wish that on anybody. I wish he was still alive today. That, that don't, I don't want to make the wrong impression. But mm-hmm. uh, he was telling everybody he got me fired from WWF. But I'm convinced it was Pat Patterson that uh, that uh, had me uh, discharged. And the way they fired me was funny. It wasn't funny at the time, but looking back, I came back from making sales calls at Tyler Meats, and my secretary says, some place called the WWF called and said not to come back anymore. So <laughs> their secretary fired my secretary. Fire my secretary fired me from the WWF because they didn't have the decency. You know, I fired guys in the meat business and at uh, and at uh, wrestling. And if a guy wasn't, fit, you know, obviously I'm going to go that I wasn't what they were looking for. I'm not going to sit there and make complaints this and that. They didn't like what they saw. They didn't want me there. Uh, I'll concede to that. I could, I didn't measure up what they wanted. Well, you know, I was friends with uh, George Steele and Jay Strongbow, and not quite as much, but a little bit with Gorilla Monsoon. I would think that one of the lieutenants could have taken me aside and said, hey, Jerry, you know, it's just not what we're looking for right now. Maybe down the road. The other guy save his dignity a little bit. It was just a low-class move. But uh, since then, I don't think I'm talking out of school that Vince McMahon has come off as a real low-class person. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay. You know, it's, it's a fact. and I'd say it to his face. I mean, I'm not sitting here hiding anywhere. But, no, uh, that's for sure. He's done a lot of terrible things. Now the WWE is under new management and I hear they're going nothing but up. Is that right? I Oh my I gosh. Mean, yeah, they are. They are. Worst promotion ever. You ever, you, ever, you ever hear the old expression, printing money? That's what they're doing right now. I mean, they're filling oh, football yeah. stadiums all over the world, not just in the United States. It's amazing. I, I'm glad for them. I uh, I worked for them uh, for briefly in Kuwait. We used to have football at Kosako stadiums there. They weren't filled up, but they were pretty packed. We we did a lot of business in the Middle East, and they, and they let me go on one of the tours, which was something I'd never have gotten to do if it weren't for Vince McMahon. So uh, I just, uh, uh, like I said, I'd like to have gone farther. But then again, so many lives are ruined by these people. They, they get up there, and they got to work every night, and it ruins your health, and these guys are dropping dead at 60. And uh, maybe it was, uh, it was the right thing for me just to enjoy myself and uh, – yeah, and I'm and I just turned seventy-seven. Well, it, what you're telling me though is when you 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 kind of stuck it out with uh, Bruiser Bedlam to the very end, yeah. and uh, you help you. I know you help cultivate a lot of young stars that are, have gone on to superstardom. Sure. I mean, we haven't even talked about people like Al Snow and you know other people that passed through your organization. Am I right about you that? Al Snow in your show yet? No, I have not. Not yet. Well, ask him two questions. Okay. Who was the first promoter to put you on television? And who was the first promoter to put a major uh, championship belt around your waist? You and Mickey Doyle, the WWE Tag Team right. Champion. Right, right. Ask him who was the first one to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see Al, uh, he, he, we, we get along well. He's good-natured about it. But I, that's what I always ask him. So if you ask him that, and he'll probably hear about he listens to your show. He'll be, he'll be ready for it. But ask him anyway. There you go. Right. All right. I'll have to remember that. Yeah. So let me yeah. let me ask you about a, a few more people. Uh, Wojo, to me, was the most intimidating looking human being I've ever seen. More so than a big muscle guy. You know, he just had that look of rock hard meanness. Well, 
he was a, a you know when he was a senior in high school 1968 he missed going to the olympics by one match and he lost by one point to bob roop wow he was a senior in high school and earlier that year in a national aaus he beat bob roop now this is him as a senior before any college experience whatsoever then he went to college and only lost a couple of matches his whole time there was the ncaa champion beat big chris taylor more than once but chris taylor beat him in one of the ncaa finals uh, but Wojo was also an NCAA champion, runner-up, and uh, he had a tremendous amateur background, and he could bench. I watched him do it. He would put 500 pounds on a bench and bench it without a spotter at Torrio's gym. He was unbelievably strong, took to pro wrestling. A lot of times, amateurs have trouble doing that. There's some guys like Roshke and that that did very well. Chris Taylor did. I wrestled Chris Taylor once in Akron, and he was he was a good worker. I mean, he, he, he could have killed me, and he did not. Yeah. He chose to let me know. <laughs> so he was a he was a good guy, and uh, but there, there were some guys that just uh, didn't didn't get it. Okay, that's all I can say. It's like it's like trying to tell a stranger about rock and roll. I mean, uh, they, <laughs> right? Yeah, they, they didn't they didn't get what we were doing. But Wojo, I always thought, forget me. I mean, he would go into the arenas all over the Midwest and take on challengers from the audience. Right. And there was there was college wrestlers that would show up. There were some really good wrestlers, there were some street fighters that didn't get very far, but. Uh, but the one match I never forgot was in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And Flying Fred Curry was promoting the match. And I was putting up, at, at the time, the promoter was putting up to $10,000. But then the guy shows up. It was the National Junior College Heavyweight Champion. Fred didn't want to put up the money. He said, this is just supposed to be for regular people. And the guy says, hey, you advertised. You didn't say regular people. So the guy got a little spotty. So Wojo's shaved head turned red. He looked at the guy and he says, Jerry, you got $10,000? I says, we, we we do together. Yes. Why? He says, okay. I'm. He says, Fred, don't worry. I'm putting up the $10,000. But any amateur like you that would come down and try to screw things up for another amateur is not a nice person. I'm going to tell you something. When you get in that ring, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you bad. So you'll be ready because you're trying to take food off. He was working himself into a rage. This was not a work. He was working himself into a psychotic rage, Walter. This other amateur who was a national champion would try to come down and make him look bad. The guy wouldn't get in the ring. He said, oh, I thought there was a match here. I didn't know this was going to be a ring. I, I can't, I've never wrestled in a ring before, so he used that as an excuse to get out. But mm-hmm. I, Walter was very even tempered and he had, didn't get mad a lot. But this guy made him so mad, I would not have wanted to have been him and take on Wojo. But uh, after that, we just told the promoters, we'll put up to 10000 and you got to pin Wojo in five minutes. It's not last five minutes or last 10 minutes. To win the money, you had to pin Wojo. Good luck. Good luck. I don't yeah. think there's any pros that going to pin Wojo in five minutes. You know, with Wojo's skill in amateur wrestling, in amateur wrestling, they're big on stalling. They don't let you stall. But if Wojo would have run into somebody, which he, he, he did one time, he had a guy that he knew from the Olympic trials in Brighton, Michigan. And I, if the match had been a real amateur match, Wojo won two to one. There was, Wojo got a takedown and the guy got an escape. And this guy was really tough. And the place was going crazy. They, I don't know what his real name was, but they used to call him, they called him the Orange Crush. The place was absolutely packed, sold out. He was a wrestling coach at that school, and he had Olympic credentials. And that guy was tough, but like they said, Wojo, all you have to do is stall. The five minutes is up. The guy hasn't made the, the agreement. You got to pin Wojo in five minutes. So what Wojo did was with this guy, he stalled a lot. <laughs> 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 and the five minutes was up, and uh, nobody ever claimed the prize. Yeah. Wow. I mean, le- legit tough, legit, all in capital letters. I mean, I, I never, like I never saw like, a guy that intimidating ever. I don't know, but somebody like uh, WWF or WCW wouldn't have hired Wojo, even at the second tier. In other words, put him on crew, let him win most of his matches. Then when you go to cities, you can work out with the local college wrestling team or high school wrestling team, and you get real street cred beating up the, the, the college guys from around uh, the local universities, which he could have done quite easily in those days. But I can tell you how tough he was. You know, there was a decided that pro wrestling and amateur wrestling were different sports. So an amateur wrestler could wrestle pro and still come back to the amateurs because they figured that the set of skills were so different. It wasn't like college basketball or college, uh, you know, sports where you enhance your talents. Uh, college wrestling doesn't do a thing to help pro wrestling. <laughs> Nothing, zero, nada. 
when Wojo was in his 40s, he was out in Las Vegas with his son, and at the last minute, he entered a national uh, a- uh, AAU championship, and in 40-some years, not having an amateur match in uh, probably 15 or 20 years, he took uh, third in the country. <laughs> huh. He was up in his 40s. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I understand, though, from, from what uh, other couple, you can verify this for me, that Wojo, with all his skill and all his talent, kind of like staying close to, to, the, to that territory. I don't think he had any ambition to move up. Would you know differently or because he always well, stayed and he didn't really venture anywhere else? Well, uh, they, 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 they booked him on a WWF show at Kobo. And they gave him a not really good opponent to work with. So he had a bad match. But it wasn't Wojo's fault because I, I would have liked to wrestle to myself if we had to because I wanted to look. This guy was a big fat guy and he didn't know anything. He was new and he was great. And, uh, and it wasn't that. Uh, uh, and then. Rick Flair told Wojo he had him booked in Atlanta. And at the last minute, uh, Wojo, had, his car was packed. He was ready to drive to Atlanta. And just some, some sixth sense told him to call down there. And they had no idea what Flair was talking about. He said, we don't have you booked down here. And uh, he, he, Wojo said, he don't know why he got this flash, but something told him to call. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, uh, Flair's uh, IQ had been uh, under question well over the years. Why would he uh, tell Wojo he's booked in Atlanta? Wojo was down in Puerto Rico for Carlos Colon, and he met Flair down there. And Flair said, "Yeah, I made the calls. Here's your, he gave him a starting date and everything." Okay, Flair telling you that it's real, you know? Yeah, I, I can't even fathom what's going on on that one. That's that's over my head. Wow, well, I don't know. Flair would be fine, you know. You, can, you get older sometimes, like my, myself, you slow down a little bit. But uh, uh, sometimes, but Flair was probably in his thirties when that happened. So. Uh, no excuses about being old, you know. <laughs> yeah, at that point, no, absolutely not. I don't know what to add. Oh, let's ask you. Let's go way back with you. Your association with Doctor Jerry Graham. How did it? Sure. St- how did it start? Where did it lead? And what happened in the period after that till the part where I'm picking up now what you've been okay, talking well, about? That's easy. This, this is an easy one. I was working for the Sheik as a job guy, and I was he had me on full time anyway. Uh, and he had Jerry Graham there as well, and Jerry wasn't being treated that well anyway. Of course, he was overweight and past his prime, but at least they were giving him work. So he lived in Toledo, so we started riding together as a matter of convenience. And then when you start riding with the guy, you become friendly with him. Quickly picked up on his faults. He, he drank too much, and uh, he knew a lot about wrestling. He was a genius when he was sober. He got this idea uh, for me to be his uh, son. <laughs> and so... We had started uh, flying Fred Curry. And the first time I went, went as his son, I managed Jerry in a brass knuckles match against Wild Bull Curry in Toledo. I said this story before, but we thought that Bull Curry and Jerry are both too old and that what, there should be at least one young guy in the match. And I'm going to tell you, those two guys tore the house down. Which goes to show you, if you got him upstairs, Jerry was obviously sober that night. And Bull Curry was always consummate on the spot. Work a great man. Great gentleman in real life, too. And they tore the house down. They did a great job. So Fred Curry started using me and Jerry Graham as a tag team. And we used to wrestle him and his dad, you know, father-son versus father-son. And uh, we went all over uh, Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Picked up a guy along the way there that you may know, uh, Bobby Fulton, Jimmy Hines. Oh, he yeah. Was just, he was just starting as a rough ring that for Fred Curry at that time. And one of the biggest riots Jerry and Graham and me were ever in was they had uh, Jimmy was a uh, referee in a match. He might have been 16 or 17. I think he was still in high school. And if I'm not mistaken, it might have been the high school he went to. They had a fundraiser, and he was going to referee. And when he disqualified me and Jerry, we beat him up, and the place went crazy. It had a full-scale riot, and the Currys had to come out and fight us back to the dressing room. They put us in between them. We were in the middle, so they were protecting us. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the fans were storming the ring. They were coming in the ring to get us. We went too far with that. That's, you, sometimes you get too much heat. It's not good. Oh, yeah. I, it, it, the old Ox Baker, Ernie Ladd thing, right? When uh... Yep. I mean, the biggest of all time, uh, this is a matter of opinion. I, I, I saw that Ernie Ladd went on videotape. I don't think there was any film of them. But the one that is considered by many to be the ultimate riot was Jerry Graham and Dick the Bruiser against Antonio Rocca and Ed Carpaccia in Madison Square Garden. Yep, it's legendary. Even I know about that one. 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, I heard about it from Jerry Graham and from Victor Bruiser at different times in different cities. I was told the exact same story. So there's a strong possibility that I got the real goods. The match ended with Jerry Graham and Bruiser losing. Just like I told you about the Rip Hawk said if, the, if uh, Victor Bruiser would have won and the Sheik would have thrown fire in his face, the heat would have been fantastic. Same thing. Bruiser and Graham lost. But then uh, Bruiser picked up a chair and hit Rock in the head with it. And Graham saw that he was bleeding nice and good. They started beating up Rock and Carpentier. And the fans stormed the ring. And it was bad. They had to call a riot squad. There was injuries. They banned wrestling in New York for a period of time. Then they brought it back with no children allowed, like uh, like right. the movie and Bell bookstore. Right, yeah. And, and finally, so that's uh, – nothing was gained by that riot except a good story for us guys to talk about 50 years ago. <laughs> when you get too much heat – in fact, when I was managing uh, Adrian Adonik and Dick Murdoch in St. Louis, some guys attacked them. And unlike John Studd, Murdoch and, and Adonis and I were uh, a team. We acted like a team. And these guys attacked Adrian and, and uh, Dick Murdoch, so I jumped in. And we started fighting with the fans, and Vince McMahon came running over and woke up and said, get back in the ring, get back in the ring. And I'll tell you, he was absolutely right. He said, that thing would have turned into a riot. It wouldn't have been any good. He could have lost St. Louis. He could have lost TV. So, but the thing is, that's why they've really tightened up uh, security, because uh, if you get too much of that, it's, it's not good. You want no. just enough. Uh, Jerry Graham would tell me heat was like a speeding bullet. Uh, you get to a point. And then after that, it's no good anymore. It slows down. And he said, and that's what happens when you go too far. The, the bullet dies. You, uh, It could still kill you, but it doesn't got that impact. <laughs> you got angles to a certain point and then stop. The match where Chris Carter took your cast off and beat you senseless and bloody with yeah. it, that mm-hmm. looked like a riot was a break. Am I wrong? I'm watching that tape and I'm like, there is so good much heat in that building. Good was, security. That looked like security. it was close, right? It, it felt was, like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Good security prevented, uh, prevented the, yeah, they were really, they were really going out at that night. It was, uh, no, that was something I came up with, uh, just take the, the cast off the leg. But Go it ahead. was, but it was beautiful because the fans cared. The yeah. fans cared that you were defenseless, had your cast ripped off, and you're being beaten senseless and bloodier than anybody had ever seen. They cared. They really care. You know how hard that was to pull off in the mid '80s. I'm telling you, that kind of heat didn't happen anywhere but in that match. You know, they say there's no baby face like an old heel. <laughs> as soon as I had the car wreck, I started apologizing to fans. I said because my room was filled with flowers and stuff, and people wanting to see me. I said I didn't realize how much you people cared. I want you to know that you moved me, and I'm I'm with you now. And I mean, I, I put on the whole deal, and uh, and they love me. That was uh, like when Bull Curry would turn babyface and team up with Fred. They right, loved yeah. him. Mm-hmm. They, they, they loved him. I always thought, once again, opinions are, are like noses. Everybody has one. Right, <laughs> right. But when they had the Montreal screw job and Bret Hart left under hard terms, I think the Hart family are tremendous. I never met Bret, but Ross, his brother, is a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. But uh, I always thought, you know, everybody knew he got screwed. The fans, it was just what the fans knew about it immediately. And he punched Vince McMahon, and there's pictures of McMahon, and the fans didn't like McMahon. They were so happy that Bret Hart slugged McMahon. Isn't it? So Bret goes to work for WCW, and I'm thinking they came out with the Canadian flags, O Canada, and he kept up his I Hate American routine. I always wondered, and once again, maybe it wouldn't have worked. I don't know everything, but just my idea. If Bret Hart would have come out and says, you people know I've been to work for another promotion, I feel a lot of bad things about the United States of America that I didn't mean them. I'm going to be honest with you. I got a family. They paid me a lot of money to say these things. And the only reason I came to WCW is because they said I can speak my mind. There's no restriction to what I say. And you people in the United States, I love you. Bret Hart would have been the most fantastic baby face. He was a great WCW champion. I mean, I thought that they really wasted it by keeping him as a heel. He yeah. was a great heel, don't get me wrong, but I think as a baby face at that particular point, let the storylines lap from one promotion to another. It doesn't matter. Everybody knew that he got screwed by McMahon, and everybody knew that he punched McMahon. It was in all the papers, and it was good for the business because it gets people talking. 
Well, I thought maybe you would disagree with me. I don't care that. But a great thing I would have been if Brett would have come in right out of the box of WCW as a baby face. But that's not what they did. No, I, <laughs> I, I agree with you. I think he, uh, he, he came in, to be honest, flat. I, you know, he's such an exciting wrestler. But he came in flat because he was just best- kind of, you know what I'm saying? He, it just, there was no, after two months, it was like, what were they doing with him? I never did figure out what was trying to do with Brett. I, and, no, and it was such a waste of me. I just didn't know, you know, I, I, I used to uh, run Toledo for a brief period of time for WCW. And at that time, they were pitiful. They forgot to put the promos on the tapes. They, uh, we could do a whole story on that. Uh, they did everything wrong. There were so many opportunities. And, but first of all, if you don't put the promos on a tape, nobody's no, going to know you're coming to Toledo. You got to say, we're going to be in Toledo. And, uh, and, and they weren't drawing very well, but it wasn't the wrestler's fault. It was absolutely the promotion's fault. Yeah. A guy named Jim Hurd was running at that time. Oh, I yeah. I was calling them. There's a wonderful lady named Georgia. And I was calling Georgia. I worked the phone. And I was telling her, we got a problem in Toledo. I need to talk to somebody that knows what they're doing. My contact there did not know wrestling. He was a nice enough guy. I'm not going to say he was dumb because he might have been very smart, but he did not know wrestling. And I couldn't get anybody that knew wrestling to come and talk to me. He had a problem in Toledo. Uh, and the, and the uh, arena manager down there, Barney Levengood, a very good guy. He used to manage the arenas in Baltimore and Indianapolis. He said, most of the times, the promoters... The big promotion complains about the local promoter screwing up, but in this case, he was he was seeing what I was going to. It's the exact opposite. The WCW has got uh, got uh, nothing. They're not promoting. They're not putting promos. I, yes. I told them that if they would have Ric Flair wrestle Wojo in Toledo, they'd do a huge business that they wouldn't hear. Terry Funk agreed with me, by the way. He said they're really not getting what you're saying. Wojo wouldn't draw anything in Atlanta or Houston or Charlotte or. Tampa, but in Toledo against Wo- uh, Ric Flair, Wojo, got to pack the place. That's a great point. Yeah, right. And, and Terry says, when I run promotions, I always used to listen to my local promoters. You know, he ran Amarillo. He had local promoters in all the towns because they got their ear to the ground. They know what's going on and they can give us information that can help us draw money. And I didn't get that kind of cooperation from WCW. I can't believe that this man didn't put him out of business quicker, except I will say this after I was gone. They did bring in better people to run the place, and they yeah. did uh, do okay for a while. Well, this I, is more Hogan. You probably don't know this. I worked for two different versions of WCW's magazine. Okay. And I hate to say this, and I never name names, but I know exactly what you're talking about when it comes to miscommunication and stuff falling through the cracks. It just was the way it was for a long time there. And I'm not putting anybody down, but it was like so frustrating. Even for people, somebody like me trying to get information for the magazines, like it was like pulling teeth. They didn't have the right people for the right job. You know, if I would have been Ted Turner, I'd have done my homework, and I would have put one person in charge. I guess they had several people in charge down there. I heard each, different people had different groups of guys working for them. Hogan had his group. I heard that uh, Kevin Sullivan had his group, and, they, and the groups were fighting within each other. I would have, uh, first of all, I would have said, Terry Funk is the guy to bring in and put in charge of this promotion. And he might have been a little bit too old, but another one would have been Mark Lewin. Genius. I'm telling you, the man was a genius. He's still alive today. Yes, Mark he was, is. Yeah. He was close to 90. He was a genius. But we're going back, it had been in his 60s then. I think he could have been a booker then. And he was, gee, there was so many smart, sharp guys out there. that they, uh, And they, they offered Dick the Bruiser the job as a booker down there. He didn't want it, so it was too much work. <laughs> and that upset me because if Boozer would have gone down there, I think that I would have had a spot. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. No, Never that sounds right. That sounds right, yeah. yeah. You know, and, uh, you know. but there is one thing about wrestling promotion. I think you'll agree with this. Somebody in the business once told me this line. When it comes to, like, managing wrestlers backstage, if everybody has to win, everybody loses. What he meant by that was there are some wrestlers who just didn't want to lose. You well, couldn't make them lose. It's in their contract that they will always go over or, or something like that. And like you said, there were factions. Whenever you have factions of this group and that group and another group, what it does ultimately is result in unsatisfying cards for the fans because you'll have double, you'll have double count outs and draws and things that aren't satisfying. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. 110% I agree with it. And I'll tell you what, when I was booking Bruiser Bedlam, I'd did many a job in the middle of the ring. Oh, we yeah. wanted to keep we wanted to keep the fans 
entertain. They're the ones that were important. And you had to give them what they wanted. And when you got guys, I'll tell you something. I made a study of this. And boxing is similar to wrestling. It's not exactly the same. But the biggest gates, and you can check this out, that Muhammad Ali ever had was after somebody beat him. When he fought Joe Frazier again after losing. When he fought Ken Norton again after losing. When he fought Leon Spinks again after losing. The comeback was in Wojo after losing to Steiner a bunch of a bunch of matches. Wojo never drew like he did. I heard some people on uh, shows like you have, what do they call I'm sorry. Uh, Podcasts. Podcast say what a horrible mistake I made having Rojo lose to a rookie, but it, it created a sensation, a, a long-lasting sensation. Not just that night; it wasn't just instant gratification. It was a, a months of Steiner screwing Rojo out of the belt. And people want to see people want to see the rematches. It's only logical, right? Yeah, but Rojo would do the job. Mm-hmm. Rojo, and then finally at the end, Steiner did the job for Rojo when he was leaving. He was a gentleman. Right. He put Rojo over the middle of the ring. And Wojo got the belt back. I mean, that was uh, the business. You see, I'm, I'm not wanting to lose. I am so happy to talk to you because I, the biggest satisfaction I got out of being on the fringes of the wrestling business was talking to people like Gordon Soley and Jerry Jarrett and yourself and Eric Embry, people who have, have, you know, have been decision makers when it comes to building a card, building a feud, making, making a show work, pacing a show. That's the stuff that that I find fascinating about pro wrestling. It's not who the biggest star is. And I think one of the biggest problems these all the promotions of all sizes have made are undefined fuzzy finishes that leave everybody unhappy. And when you paid good money to see a main event and it turns out, oh, he gets the belt back due to a rules technicality. The AWA used to do that all the time. You know, Stanley Blackburn says he's got to give the belt back because the, the second referee wasn't the real first referee. You know how this stuff goes? Yeah. It was like, oh. it, and that that makes people stay home. Ask the Sheik. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't have to ask Sheik. I was there watching him. Uh, if he, Ernie Ladd told me this. I, I wasn't privy. This is a, it's in my, uh, I've told this story before. But Ernie Ladd said uh, he got with the Sheik and the, the joint was on its butt and they decided to, uh, he was going to come in and help the Sheik. So he said, he says, what you need here is a young baby face champion. And I got just a guy, I believe his name was Jerry Oates out of Georgia. Mm-hmm. There's a guy named Jerry Oates. Sounds right. Okay. Well, anyway, Ernie Ladd brings him in. They put him on TV and have him beat a few job guys. But Ernie Ladd takes him to Cobo Hall and Ernie puts him over right square in the middle. No foot on the rope, no fuzzy finishes. It was a pimp. And then, due to him beating Ernie Ladd, now the Sheik, had, according to Ernie, was doing like eight or ten thousand dollars, which is deaf at Cobo Hall. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, Jerry Oates was going to wrestle the Sheik for the belt, and they had thirty thousand dollars. And Ernie Ladd says, "You go out there and put that guy over. Then we're going to bring in Abdul the Butcher and a bunch of heels, line him up for this guy to work with. We're going to have a babyface champion." She says, "I can't do it, man. Can't do it." So he goes out and he uses his gimmick and screws uh, uh, Jerry Oates over. And uh, Ernie Lance says, the next show, they were down to 10000 again. Yeah. And once again, I, I, Sheik and I, uh, Sheik started me. I owe a lot to the Sheik. And he was a legend. But I just, at the end of his career, he just didn't want to let go. If you would have, I mean, I, I, I would have stuck with him at the end, except he got mad and fired me once in Indianapolis, Jerry Graham and I both. And we weren't partners either. Jerry and I just rode to Indianapolis to work a show for Bruiser, and he got in a fight with Jerry Graham about something that had happened in Toronto. And up to that point, I had never even wrestled in Toronto. I didn't even know what they were talking about. Mm-hmm. And he fired both of us. I just kind of was riding with Jerry. And that's when I got involved with Curry and Graham after we got fired. I do not have any idea. To this day, his son, Eddie Jr., who was also a friend of mine, he, he called me once a few years back. I know he's passed on now. Course of our conversation, he says, Whatever happened to you? You stopped coming around. I says, Your dad fired me. <laughs> and he did. Why? I said, I have no idea. He wouldn't come to the phone and talk to me. I, I asked, I said, Just tell me what I did. And he wouldn't. But as soon as I went to work for uh, Fred Curry, then he was calling me. And uh, it was too late. The Sheik was an innovator. He was a great wrestler. He and Bo Curry 
Bull Curry a little bit sooner because he was older, but they pioneered hardcore wrestling. Right. There's a lot of good things about the Sheik, but at the end, he just wouldn't let anybody beat him. I mean, there are tales of, uh, I don't know if, it, I can't remember if it was Detroit or Toronto, but Andre the Giant came in and he did the fire thing at the end and there was a count out loss for Andre. And they some experts say that was the beginning of the end. The fans said, if he can't beat Andre the Giant, he's never going to be beaten. They stopped coming. And then probably the match was like three minutes or something like, you know what I'm saying? It, it's like, there was another problem. I think his, his matches got too short. Yeah, they did. Uh, he and Bruiser had a match in a cage. It was only a couple of minutes long. In a cage. Uh, in a cage, yeah. They built a cage for a two-minute match, really. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, uh, I had no 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 dog in the fight because I was working for Bruiser then. We didn't start Bruiser Bell until after the Sheik had left. I I didn't come in and double cross the Sheik or anything like that. He was already you know shut down, and he was working like independence and that. That's when I got put the thing together, and then Miller Beer approached me about sponsoring me, which was yeah. very rare. But it's usually hard. But Sam Botek Jr., once again, a blessed memory, he sponsored it and made it happen. John Robinson Block, who owns a Toledo Blade and, and Buckeye Broadcast uh, uh, Cable System, uh, Broadband, or whatever they call it, they changed the name, but he got us on TV. And then Dennis Cattell of Channel 36, he taught me how to produce and direct TV shows. So those three guys were essential in making Bruiser Bellum a success. And that's what I'm talking about. None of them are wrestlers, but they're all behind the scenes. And, you know, that's what guys don't understand. They think, oh, I learned how to throw a drop kick and buy a ring. I can be a promoter. But some of the best promoters never had a match in their life. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. never had a match. Jim Barnett never had a match. You can go all over and pick out guys that have never had a match, but they knew the behind-the-scenes stuff, how to deal with the television, how to get sponsors. you got to have specialists like that. Not everybody. And I watch these guys, you say, we'll pay a $50 a match, and you can be champion, or we'll pay a 500 a match, and you can be the challenger. They'll take the 50. And you know that's true, too. There's guys, not everybody, but there's guys that are so intent on being champion and winning, they don't care what we're doing, and what we're doing is trying to draw money. That's what we're doing. Who wins or who loses doesn't matter as long as everybody compensated fairly for their their, their effort, get paid correctly. But uh, you, you guys lose lose sight of what we're here for, mm-hmm. selling tickets. Right. I, I got to tell you, I am so proud and honored that you're on this show. And, I, and here's why. The job you did, man, the job you did in Indianapolis with Dick the Bruce, I am telling you, it's wrestling's best kept secret. And I want more people to know about it. You, know, you told you. the truth about how successful it actually was. You know, I've, I've had people write to me, go, they didn't draw anybody. Yeah, you did. Particularly in that time period. I was there. I was working in the business at that point. I knew how bad the houses were around the country. Mm-hmm. So you guys, what, what you did was practically a miracle. I'm telling you. There's no question about it. It's always the curves and mongrels that snip away at the tails of champions. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like the old Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. on TV right there. That's something you I would have am, said back I then. I really am the old Dr. Jerry Graham. <laughs> <Yeah. right now. laughs> but how much, how, much, so how, much of, so- how much of Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. on TV was you? I think it's about 75%, right? I mean, that's you. Well, when I was in school, <laughs> I, used to, I used to kid guys. I used to bust guys chops and stuff and uh, – uh, they knew I was kidding. I mean, I, I didn't get beat up a lot or anything, but it was, uh, I wrestled uh, amateur. I wasn't that good, but I, I enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, but I would say you're probably maybe closer to 60, 40. All right. I, okay. I, I like making upsetting people. I liked, uh, I loved Muhammad Ali when I was a kid. I loved the way he got everybody upset. And, uh, I loved wrestling. I loved Buddy Rogers. He was, uh, to me, excellent wrestler. And he was, in fact, I'll tell you a funny story. I only met Buddy Rogers once in 1992 at uh, Cauliflower Alley in Studio City, California. And I said to him, you know, you know I might sound, be sounding like a mark, but I mean, you were the reason I became a wrestler. I mean, I used to watch you on television. I thought you were the greatest, and you, you got me inspired to, to be a pro wrestler. And he kind of beamed. He's probably heard it a lot. I understand. I want to overdo it, but that was for me. And I'm sure he didn't feel bad about it, some kid coming up to him, a young guy. So... Fifteen years later, so I'm at the California Alley at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas, and a young guy came up to me and says, Jerry Graham, I just want you to know that you're the reason. <laughs> he gave me the same speech I gave Buddy Rogers. 
Except I was the old man all of a sudden. Wow. I, I didn't want to be, I wanted to be the young guy looking up. But I, was, I was a gray haired old guy that was uh, hitting the speech, but it did make me feel good that he said he watched me and uh, uh, I inspired him to get into wrestling. I don't even know his name. I don't remember he introduced but himself to me. It doesn't make you feel good, though, because to this day, it's been like 40 years since I worked at those magazines and people still go, oh, man, I remember reading when you did this. They remembered, and it makes me feel good. How about you? Does anybody ever walk up and go, boy, I remember when you did this or you said that? Doesn't yeah. it give you kind of a lift? Yeah, you? It's kind of cool, right? To. Yeah. Uh, not like I used to. I probably don't recognize it as much as I've gotten older, but I'm so old, I've been there and done that. <laughs> the problem is I forget where I've been and what I've done, but I know I, I must yeah. have done something. But uh, once in a while, it used to be a lot earlier on, but now every now and then somebody will come up to me and uh, – I'm always happy to talk wrestling with him because I, I felt like this then, and I felt like this now. Is that the only reason that we were there is because of the fans buying tickets, right? And no matter how much heat I got during the night, uh, if somebody wanted an autograph or if somebody wanted to talk to me or get their picture taken with me, I always obliged them because you know these guys they get mad at the fans, they'd make the fans mad, and then they'd get mad because the fans would be. And I says, that's what we're here for. We're here to get the fans excited and, and, and ready to go. And uh, whatever fans got mad at me, uh, like I once said to my mother, rest her soul, blessed memory, that uh, uh, you must have a lot of people know you in Fort Wayne. She said, I don't know anybody in Fort Wayne. Well, geez, I was there last night and they kept saying, your mother does this and your mother does that. I, 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 I <laughs> she had a sense of humor. She, she laughed. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, you know what I love too. I went to a wrestling convention last year, right? And I'm, I'm watching the fans interact with old villainous wrestlers who were bad guys in the day. And every one of them walks up, shakes the guy's hand, and goes, "Boy, I used to hate you. Can I have your autograph?" <laughs> right? I mean, uh, I was demolition. They were talking to. Oh, uh, I don't give a uh, uh, Edie. Bill Edie, Edie, yeah, right, yeah. Good, good guy. Good but you guy. know what I'm saying? The same fans that used to despise the wrestler 30 <laughs> years ago now can't wait to meet him and shake their hand. Only yeah. wrestling does that. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I, I go to a few shows here and there. They don't remember me as much as I got. I know I was you know, on the major network shows. But there are some people. Who, sorry, I'll tell you a funny story. I was up, usually healed in Indianapolis. Then I went to Hawaii for five weeks. And I'm wrestling at an army base there, Schofield Barracks, I think it was called. And I'm wrestling a guy. I, I was a baby face in Hawaii. I'm I was wrestling Don Morocco. Oh. And we're having a match. All sorts of guy in the audience says, hey, Graham, I'm from Indianapolis, and I still think you're a expletive. <laughs> 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 yeah. You're not, you're not fooling me. I still think you're, you're, you're let's say jerk. He right. used profanity, but I'm not going to say that. Right, so, right. I appreciate I, that, I, yeah. I was trying to laugh it in the ring, even. I was saying, you know, I was trying so hard. I was selling. I was coming back with clean baby face moves and stuff. And uh, uh, this guy, he was still mad from Indianapolis. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Dr. Jerry Graham Jr., I just want to express my deep appreciation. This is the show I've wanted to do since I started this thing because I was so impressed with your work. Everybody I know who knows you is impressed with your work. Um, I think you b belong in the pantheon of great wrestling minds. Uh, I really do. I like, like a Terry, oh, excuse me, like a Kevin Sullivan, like a Jerry Jarrett, you know, amongst the promoters and people behind the scenes who really made the, you know, the wheel go around. You were one of those. And I'm so glad you set the record straight about how much six real live success you had with Dick Absolutely. the Bruiser. And let's get that record out there and let people know. I heard somebody call what you did a minor league promotion. And I took umbrage. I said, don't you dare say that. Don't you dare say that. You were doing better numbers in that period than virtually probably Memphis was at that, that point of the way things were going. I really, I really don't know about that, but I do know we were, we're successful. And uh, uh, we always uh, we, we had a get together a few months ago. And I just asked the question, what do you suppose we would have done if it had been the old days and there was no other wrestling promotions on the networks and we were the only game in town? How good would we have done? And wow. Yeah. We would never have known, but we think we would have been successful. We were on TV in Detroit, Toledo, Fort Wayne, Indianapolis, Chicago, and Springfield, Illinois. And that's how far Bruiser and Bedlam covered. It was, uh, it was a territory. We were wrestling it about was. 20 times a month, 20 yeah. times. 20 times a month we wrestle, and uh, 
we were making money. You didn't have nitrate, you'd lose money, but overall, the promotion made money. Every year was a big, big profit. And like I said, I saved some, and everybody knew exactly what was saved. Every, on every, every single card, they got a report. Not a weekly report, not a monthly report. Here's a report on Fort Wayne. Here's a report on Toledo. Here's a report on Ann Arbor. You know, how much came in? How much each wrestler got paid? What was the rent? What was every other expense we had? Insurance at the bottom, profit or loss, and then uh, our share of the profit and what went in the bank and the current balance. And everybody was comfortable with that because they knew that I had a reputation for integrity and honesty. I, I won't go into detail, but once years before I got involved in promotion, I had eight partners in it. And they fought over everything except one thing. They wanted me to handle the money because nobody trusted anybody, but they all trusted me. And <laughs> they all got a fair account. Yeah. That's nice. That's great. Well, fans, Dr. Graham Jr., uh, I will always call you that because that's who you are in my heart because you're Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. And he, your name is Jerry Jaffe, but I will say nobody better, man. Nobody better. I, I really mean that. I don't care about WWE and WCW or anything. I don't put anybody, I don't ever say anybody's the best, but there was nobody that's better. Right. Than, but there was nobody better than you were. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's, I really mean that. And I really mean the fact that I've heard all about you, of course, and I was really flattered that you wanted to be on your show. Because you have a pretty stellar reputation yourself in the world of wrestling. And I, uh, I was very happy when uh, you contacted me because I, I wanted to do this show as, as much as you say you wanted me on the show. So we, we both got our wish tonight. I'll tell you a little secret. I still am like, like hesitant to contact some people I'm in awe of. I'm like, would, you know, I feel like a kid. Would you come on my little show? You know, it's, it's like, I, I really get the feeling that, um, you know, 75% of people are going to say no when I've asked everybody and they've all said yes. So I got to get over that phobia because it's like, I think the show is pretty good, and I, I'm just happy for the success of this. But I want you to have belated success with fandom, because I, right now I'm going to tell all the fans listening, find Dave Donacy on YouTube and watch Dr. Jerry Graham Jr., Bobo Brazil, uh, The Great Wojo, Scott Steiner, Chris Carter, El Bracero, Moose Sherlock. Go down the list. Find Bruiser Bedlam. You will not be sorry. Even the earlier ones before they really got the ball rolling, they're fun to watch. And I guarantee you've never seen anything quite like it. And you get to hear Terry Sullivan call the action with the, the bruiser. Discover it. It's worth your time. I promise you. Thank you. So in any event, Jerry, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me anytime. I enjoy talking wrestling, especially with a man that enjoys talking wrestling. <laughs> there you go. All right. I certainly hope you enjoyed this show with Dr. Gary Graham Jr. I know I did. I've been waiting on this one a long time. It's like fulfillment of a dream, sort of. Really, seriously. And I want to thank people like Dave Dynasty for uh, pointing me in a lot of great directions. Dave, you're the best. Your YouTube channel is mint. Do not miss Dave's collection of videos on YouTube. We're going to have a lot of great shows coming up. We have... Uh, we have a prominent podcaster coming up. We have a major star coming up. There's a lot of good stuff coming up. I promise you. We're really working hard on this show. As well as the Outdated Entertainment Hour. And I'd like you to hear the show about uh, the TV 100, we're calling it. The 100 Influential Television Series. And the special guests on that one are Steve Ginarelli, who you know from the Arcadian Vanguard podcast, Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam. And Joe Puccio, my journalist friend who you've heard on the show many times, of GenerationXWire.com. So we have so much going on. I, I'm really, really proud of the last several episodes of both shows. I'm trying to be a little different. I'm trying to be entertaining. And you know what? I'm trying to have fun with this stuff. I said it when we started the show, and I continue to say it to this day. The concept of these shows is to look back with fondness and gratitude toward the entertainment and fun we had years back. That's it. I'm not going backstage. I'm not going to talk about the new stuff a whole lot, although, you know, it has to come up. However, I want to have fun here. Outdated is another word for classic, the way we use it. 
And I'm outdated. I'm not getting any younger. So I'm just going to march the beat of my own drummer, as the cliche says, and hope you all enjoy it. Okay? And I want to thank all of our fan club members and all of our regular listeners. Our numbers that I get um, reported to me make my eyes bug out sometimes. I'm really, really happy with you all for listening. And I appreciate it more than I can say. So I'm going to keep working hard. I am working probably too hard on this project. But you know what? You know what? Hard work leads to good things. At least it has in my life. The harder I've ever worked, the better things went. So um, this may be the last major thing I ever do. And that's fine. You know, I was on the road as a musician. I worked for PWI and a bunch of national magazines. As I, as I age now, it's like, well, let's do something fun just for me. And hope that other people enjoy it too. Speaking of other people, they're members of that fan club, which you can learn all about at outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. You can also listen to our entire history of shows for the time being on that site. Write to us, outdatedwrestling at gmail.com, if you are a fan of the show. We welcome it. We'll answer you. We promise. Find me on Facebook. I'm the only Bob Smith that's singing with BB King. Find another one. I defy you. And. I'm asking the fans to write to me at outdatedwrestling at gmail.com the, only because the Facebook mailbox is just so over full and I can't keep up with it. So I'm going to kind of separate the two things for my business associates, you know, contact me that way. But please, if you have a question, you want to just talk over old stuff, write to me at outdatedwrestling at gmail.com. And if you want to learn about the fan club, again, it's at uh, outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. This show was a long time coming. Thank you, Dr. Graham Jr. I don't know what else to say. He should be held in higher esteem in the mainstream world. There was nobody better at his peak than Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. I firmly believe that. Firmly believe it. So, we'll see you in about a week, next Friday. We'll have another great guest for you. I think it'll surprise you a little bit. News of uh, some upcoming events on that next show. So uh, be with us. As they say, be there or be square, right? My name is Bob Smith. Used to be with PWI. I hope you had fun. We'll see you next time. And I always leave you with the words of Ringo Starr. The end of every concert he does, he gives you the V with the fingers and says, Peace and love, brothers. Peace and love.